Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, amazing conference. As a way of introduction, it's uh, Naval Roy, uh, and I'm founder and CEO of Hallmask. As many of you know by now, that there is no health uh, without mental health. Uh, it has, uh, COVID has certainly made it uh, a reality that we need to pay attention to mental health more than or as much as to phys physical health. And uh, this statement uh, has become very, very real in our current time. What we are trying to achieve at Hallmask is trying to get our attention to our defining problem of our generation. If you look at the cost of behavioral health, it is one of the largest in the world. By many estimates, it's approximately around one in seven people in Singapore suffers from mental illness. Around 79% of people don't receive necessary care within 12 months. And if we consider purely from the burden of disease point of view and the disability, then it is considered one of the largest. By some estimates, uh, it is close to a trillion dollar problem, both in terms of direct and indirect cost uh, by 2030. Keeping all of that in mind, if we look at the sector, what we find that the sector is suffering from a massive evidence gap. What we mean by a massive evidence gap is the thinking around that where is the care today and what should be the ideal nature of the care that perspective is very, very challenging. And the key challenges that we are finding is there is a real poor clinical standardization in the process of the measurement. There is a lack of high quality data. There is lack of a standard, substandard, you know, a standard evidence that can be central to care delivery. And the medication itself is not as effective as it should be. The combination of all of these factors is what is called evidence gap. And we are trying to solve this problem of evidence gap through the narrative of you know, real world evidence. But before we go there, the thinking is that the clinical trial data that gets into uh, uh, running clinical trial, that is not enough because clinical trial only includes less than 2% of the pa patients who will ultimately receive interventions. And the trial and error component is so large that sometimes a typical patient goes through two or three years of trial before a particular drug may or may not work. You know? And a, a standard statistic is approximately around 60 to 70% of the patients don't respond to antidepressants. So how does real world evidence can solve this problem? And what are the different sources of the data that is out there that comprise the world of real world evidence? In this, certainly the standard tool traditionally has been surveys and patients tools. Uh, there has been clinical registries. Uh, certainly the clinical trial data has been there. There is a lot of administrative and uh, you know, claims data for the lack of a better word. And then you have electronic health record data. And as the new generation of devices are coming up, then certainly there is a remote monitoring by the different devices that is out there where the real world evidence provides is a combination of all the different data sources that gets created in the real world, where the care itself gets delivered, converting all of them into objective standard evidence, which the care itself can be used and can be mapped to a clinical trial is where the value of the real, real world evidence comes in. We strongly believe that in the field of mental health or behavioral health, RWE is going to be a game changer. And it is has a application layer that can be value driver, not only for the patients, but also for the health systems and the providers, as well as payers and pharma. Let me give you the example how we see it. For the patients, we certainly think that we can create value in the space of improved treatment options, as well as informed and personalized care. Some people have started calling is precision psychiatry, and that's the area that we can, you know, there is a value to be created. Certainly using data as a core utility for decision making is a way by which we can certainly drive uh, value add to the health systems and the providers. For building predictive tools, right now, behavioral health as a sector doesn't have much of the predictive tool at all. So doing that. 
In terms of the governments as well as the payers, I think doing patient risk stratification and risk monitoring as to what should be the care protocol for acute risk versus what should be for the medium to high risk, that is completely different. And for the pharma, certainly bringing treatments brought to the market faster because on an average, R&D for a new drug is taking anything between 10 to 12 years. And given a life of around 20 years, the IP on a particular product runs out very, very fast, which makes extremely tricky for a lot of farmers to bring new drugs to the market. There is value to be added into IP modification and the level extension and all of that. So we are strongly flee, we are strongly feel that where RWE for behavioral health and mental health is or neuropsychiatry in general is, it has the potential to become a game changer. And let me walk you through in the early sense of what are the different value proposition that we are seeing. But uh, knowing that the value of RWE, let me also start from the factor as to why real world in behavioral health suffers from all the different challenges that we are seeing. What has been the reason behind it? I think the key reason is, you know, the, there is a massive, massive variation in the sy sy symptom presentation itself and the prognosis. There is huge amount of lack of structured data because a lot of idea is essentially all around notes. There is a high degree of institutional silos by which we try to treat mental health on a standalone basis, but most of the time mental health is a function of multiple comorbidity within different mental health category itself, as well as a combination of a physical health. There is a very high degree of bias, as well as the level of expertise that goes into the diagnostic and the measurement practices itself. But most importantly, I think there is a serious lack of quantifiable biomarkers and the endpoints. And last but not the least, I think this disease is still in an area where there is a high degree of stigma and the access to care is not there. If we take the combination of all of these factors, it creates a real challenge for behavioral health as a sector to really progress. And we have seen the suffering because of that, the total as a science community, but also as a tech community is trying to figure out different ways of solving this in thousand different ways. And we strongly believe that the timing is now. And why we feel the timing is now is a combination of all the developments that has happened. The development is bringing digital health to the front. I think the digital health as a sector has a lot of value to the overall healthcare, but in behavioral health, it is probably has one of the highest value. The data science maturity itself has reached to a level where we can read and build models, both AI and NLP and the machine learning and all of that, which has serious value for reading both the structured data as well as the unstructured data. But most importantly, I think there is a real driver in the healthcare sector towards value and towards evidence. So can there be literally a value-based care or can there be an evidence-based care? Those factors are serious driver behind the mental health. And we at Hallmusk are essentially trying to build the largest real-world evidence platform to solve this evidence gap problem for behavioral health. We feel extremely excited about it. And the, as we have started you know, from Singapore in 2015, uh, here are some of the major AI strengths that we have built in this area. I think one of the main things that we have learned to build is a massive label reading using NLP models. So very specific to behavioral health, we have built NLP models that can unlock huge amount of information that is written in the free text of the clinician notes that are not usually not used for analysis. Now that tech is here and we have been able to apply that and we have published about it in the computational psychiatry paper. It is out there in the public domain. Number two, once we have been able to read that then the richness of the predictability that we are able to build both for disease severity as well as the potential risk down the line is very, very unique. So the combination of the structured plus unstructured data to build model to drive prediction, we have been able to do that. And most importantly, we have been able to generate insights that address the clinical pain points. And those pain points can range from 
classification category to early determination as well as early diagnostic. And our goal is to essentially how to drive all of those insights in a serious fashion to support clinical and administrative decisions for the care providers. Here is a very high level uh, way of uh, trying to give you a sense as to what are the process that runs. In a very macro sense, let me walk you through. We go through all the different possible sources of the real world data, whether it is at a patient level, whether it is a baseline observation level, or whether it is a longitudinal observation of different reports. The key task is converting them into a data model and then from there running all the NLP and converting them into an output, which can be very, very specific to the disease, but more importantly, it builds all the model for disease progression. I won't bore you with detail behind the mathematics and the science behind it, but this is the core of the IP that we have built over a period of time, and it is extremely powerful from that perspective. Uh, happy to share the paper with anyone, but this is what we have been working on for the last six years and has been a major milestone in terms of the progress for us as a company. The that second factor that we think that a, a way to really go deeper into the sector is through partnering with uh, as many stakeholders as possible. And we consider patient as a stakeholder, we consider health system as a stakeholder, we consider pharmaceutical company as a stakeholder, as well as the health, as well as the payer and the government as a stakeholder. Uh, we have been extremely privileged to partner with some of the leading companies. Uh, here are the two examples. We have acquired a company called Otsuka Health Solutions in the UK, which works with six different mental health trusts in, the, in uh, UK. And we have been able to reduce inpatient hospital admissions patients in crisis, case loads, and improved successful 72-hour follow-ups. All of this has been able to drive quality metrics as well as real challenges on the burden of the healthcare system in UK. And we have been very proud of it and growing this uh, you know, quite aggressively in the UK market with NHS. On the back of it, you know, Otsuka is one of the largest pharmaceutical company from Japan, and we have been able to sign a three-year partnership to drive deeper understanding of patient needs as well as real-world outcome. Uh, this deal is extremely powerful for us, but more importantly, with them, we are able to not only go and use all the different proprietary analytics model, but also we have been able to potentially drive towards running synthetic trial and external arm uh, control in that sense. So here is the evidence of two different partnerships that we have been able to achieve. Here are additional layers of partnership that we are doing. Uh, UT Health is one of the largest uh, mental health inpatient facility in the inpatient and outpatient provider in Harris County in Texas. We have partnership with them by which we are able to analyze their data and build all the predictive models that they can use for the care protocol. And we have been working with Janssen and have signed a massive MOU to build a huge R&D center to develop digital mental health strategy in China. <laughs> we are about to sign multiple other partnerships all across 20 plus in US, maybe many in continental Europe, both in UK as well as in Germany and also in China in aggressive fashion. The, the goal that we are trying to drive behind all of this is partner with as many stakeholders as possible all across the world, learn from each other, cross pollinate, and literally build the next layer of the science behind it. Here are a bit of evidence across all the different partners that we have worked. On the commercial side, you know, examples are some of the largest pharmaceutical company as well as the insurance company called AIA in Asia. Uh, many of these guys we have worked over the last four years. Um, among the research partners, we partner very aggressively across all across the globe. Uh, in Asia, uh, certainly the Institute of Mental Health and Duke and US, uh, as well as Ministry of Health. But in China, we are about to declare a partnership with the Beijing ending. In the US, it is a combination of Columbia plus UT plus CRF, and in, uh, in uh, uh, Basel is in Visapat, uh, Basel. Um, we have been lucky to be uh, recognized for our effort, I think, from Amchen and Quickfire, uh, as well as the Pingan Accelerator. 
but I think the award that is very dear to my heart and uh, you know the recognition that is uh, we are very proud of is being recognized as a, one of the tech pioneer companies by World Economic Forum in 2019. Within Singapore itself, we have worked for the last five years all the way from Ministry of Health to SGH with Health Promotion Board and Tantaxing Hospital. And in 2021, we have signed a MOU to build digital solutions with IMH and National Health Group. Uh, we are very proud of what we are building and the journey that we are taking. Uh, we have been very proud to say that we have been able to create massive value over a period of time from 2015. Uh, we founded this company. We have raised around 35 million so far. We are in three different J labs all across USA, all across the world, one in NYC, one in Shanghai, and one in DC. And we are recognized by World Economic Forum. How do we see where we are and where we are going? I think between 2015 till last year, the acquisition of MindLink happened. We built around a 40 to 45 person team, and we built one of the largest proprietary disease models and digital assets. The turning point is somehow in this year where not only we have acquired the health solutions, but also we have built partnership and we now we are approximately around 130 plus people. Where are we going in the coming years? We are in the process of raising around a very large financial round of 150 million. We are in the process of acquiring one of the largest behavioral health EHR in USA, which has a footprint across 28 different states. And we are partnering with at least 15 to 20 plus health systems, uh, you know, uh, at least in US itself. And there will be another five to 10 other health systems outside US. We estimate our team size to be approximately around 500 people by next year. And we are very, very committed to this sector. And we see this sector as growing and our role to play a central component of that as a real world FS engine. With that, it is my absolute pleasure to answer any question that the team has. Uh, thanks, Nawal, for sharing your uh, very innovative uh, evidence-based uh, approach. We actually do have a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, and by the way, I'm quite impressed that you also support your team in other pursuits of excellence, like climbing Everest. Yes. Um, yes, let me take the next question. Um, I'm recalling your talk, you mentioned real world hurdles are with data. So I want to ask a tangential question about the AI models. So the question is, um, how do you validate uh, the AI models for accuracy for, with all these complex uh, topics? Yeah, so the, the way most of these AI models work is you take a very a small subset of the data set and you train your model and if you build the model itself, which has all the biology of the disease, you know, integrated into the modeling, and then try to predict on a subset of a, another data and see, does your prediction matches with where the clinician prediction came up? Okay. So there is a very high degree of standard process by which you go through for doing that. Once you have done it, then all of these results go through a great peer review for any kind of publication, okay? So the models that you built is built in the combination of a computer scientist, a neuroscientist, as well as, you know, neuropsychiatrist or scientist, as well as a data scientist. So it's not a single talent, but it's a three layer uh, talent pool that is working on these problems on a continuous basis. And the, the predictability around that and the validation around it is done by the clinicians and the research and the peer, peer group. Thank you. Um, so we have also have another question. Um, it's interesting to note that you've been actually working with us in Singapore and data from Singapore for since 2015. So uh, some members of the audience are curious, uh, what are some data gaps uh, that you may see uh, in your six years experience with us? So I would say the, the data experience, I, uh, I, I have two observations. I think uh, the Singapore public system is extremely innovative in terms of working with uh, startups like us, okay? At one side, there is a real serious desire to work. 
Um, at the same time, there is some degree of fear which are which are real. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, I think there is a way to not to ignore those, like the privacy and the security issue. The privacy and the security issue of the data is one of the hardest problem to solve. And the idea is not doing anything is not the right solution. The idea is to how to raise the bar uh, by which all kind of security and the privacy issues can be answered and no misuse can happen, okay? And you can build the data architecture around that. And I think uh, uh, my request from the community would be to uh, not go towards, let's not do anything because that's the best way to save ourselves, okay? Uh, going back to paper is not the solution. Going forward is the solution. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think uh, the risk appetite on the capital side or the funding mechanism by which the startups can work with the health system, I think that can certainly improve, you know, uh, within the Singapore community. I mean, those are the high level structural challenges that we see. But other than that, as a system, health system, we find Singapore system as one of the most innovative system to work with. Yeah, I'm glad you brought brought up about uh, security and data privacy concerns because we have some uh, questions from the audience. Um, we we do understand uh, men mental health data, um, uh, mental health issues is really sensitive. Um, so perhaps you could elaborate more uh, how you can help uh, yeah. Yeah. address those concerns. Absolutely. So first of all, all the what they call is a PHI information. The PHI information stays with a health system, okay? A Naval Roy as an individual, the PHI information has a lot of value, but Naval Roy is a 50 year old human being with you know the different disease category and the height and the blood types. That degree of detail is, uh, you know, is of not value to anyone if it is not exposed to any, you know? So what I'm trying to say is, all the security standard has to be at a level where the PHI information stays with the clinician and with the centers. Once the data has been anonymized and anonymization standards has to be a level which can be, you know, uh, which can be the highest of the standards which defense and finance sector and some of the others, you know, the security protocol sectors maintain, healthcare also should imbibe on that degree of advancement to maintaining that degree of security, you know? So dem demarcate the PHI information from non-PHI information, and then work on all the anonymized data and literally build all the modeling architecture on the back of it, okay? That's number one. Number two, as of now, the healthcare, the frequency by which the interaction happens with the patient, that data is extremely discrete, okay? so. As of now, we only know a patient coming to a center and any continuity of that, whether they go to another center or not, that continuity of the data is not there. So if you want to build a longitudinal nature of the data with a deep you know, uh, density behind it, then we should be able to figure out how to connect the primary care with the, you know, with the mental institution as well as other care system, and then built a longitudinal provider of the patient on the back of it. So those two are the largest problem to solve. Uh, uh, you know, and I think if I were to say, the second problem is bigger than the first problem. Okay, first problem is a privacy issue, where the second problem is a real data science issue, and the integration is a big problem in a lot of healthcare system. Thank you. That was useful. Um... Um, it's also good to hear that you've uh, gathered a lot of data in your platform from across different parts of the world, I, I gather. Um, there's a question from the audience about uh, any biases uh, from, from the data model, uh, whether by gender or by ethnicity. I'm just curious, uh, how do you handle that? Yeah. So there can be uh, less of a bias. So at a, I would say at a macro level, the biases are not there. A disease is a disease is a disease. A depression patient in Western civilization is, is the same as this. The, the influencing factor, and especially around the social determinant of factors, which can be certainly influenced by genetics, which can be influenced by which part of the society you come in, and what is the upbringing has been, okay? Those factors can be there, but those are not necessarily towards literally highlighting the disease severity itself, okay? 
And I think the modeling has not gone to a level where we can be literally isolate a factor and say that, okay, here is a Asian female that has a higher probability of getting something versus Asian male, you know? And I think the science still has to get there. And I don't think all the biases have been fully understood. Okay. That, that's where I think my observations are. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Nawa. Um, you, you actually have made a very clear presentation. And uh, from the looks of it, you've also addressed a uh, lot of the questions uh, from the audience. Um, and thank, thank you so much. So uh, we've come to the close of the session. Uh, and I also like to thank the um, audience uh, for the questions uh, and your participation.